watching KCMI TV. Well, I'm glad you joined me today, and uh, we're going to read out of a couple different places in the scripture. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, and this would be a familiar story, and then probably one of the most famous portions of scripture in the Bible uh, is Psalms uh, 23. So uh, in Matthew chapter 14, what we're going to pick up is, is on the back end of Jesus doing an incredible miracle where he feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. So somewhere probably around 20,000 people that he has fed with five loaves and two fishes. And the disciples were intricately involved in this miracle. The Lord, in fact, I think we talked about this recently when the Lord asked them, what do you have? What's in your hand? And they said that, that small lunch of a boy. And Jesus took it and multiplied it. And so, you know, I don't know how long it took to feed 20,000 people, but the disciples were involved in something supernatural that lasted hours. And finally, when the remained is taken up, it's 12 baskets full. And I'm sure the disciples are just absolutely amazed at what they have just participated in and what they have saw, and they're talking about it. And it's on the, the, the end of this miracle that we want to pick up. In verse 22 in chapter 14 of Matthew, it says straightway or immediately, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And <clears throat> when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Verse 24 says, But now the ship is in the midst of the sea of Galilee, and, it, and it's literally being tossed with waves, and the wind is contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, which is somewhere between three and six o'clock in the morning, Jesus went out unto them walking on the water. It's very interesting. It says he went out unto them walking on the water. And um, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were troubled. They said, it's a spirit. And they cried out in fear. Jesus says, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Um, when I read this verse, especially in verse 22, this is where I want to start. It says that after this miracle of Jesus doing something so amazing nobody had ever seen before, he constrains his disciples to get into a ship. And I really want to dwell on this for a moment because when you go back to the Greek, uh, it's a much stronger meaning of uh, the word constrained than what we think of. It's not like he's saying, guys, you know, I need you to just get in the boat and go to the other side. It literally takes on the meaning that uh, with force, he literally forced them to get into that ship. It meant they didn't want to go. They did not want to separate from him. And he literally forces them to go, to get into the ship and to go before him unto, um, unto the other side. And uh, I think this very, I love this because if the disciples would have remembered this in the hours to come, he constrained his disciples to get in the ship to go before him unto the other side. He was going to make sure that they were going to the other side. And sometimes when we're in a storm, uh, we forget that the word of the Lord has already told us that we're going to get through it. And so he, he literally forces them. And so this, is, this storm is not the devil. And if you just think about this for a moment, Jesus sent them into a storm, not the enemy. He sent them into a storm. He forced them to go into that and get in that boat. And when they got in that boat and they get out on the sea, then the storm comes. So Jesus knew the storm was coming when he sent them. And, uh, you know, Sometimes, you know, when we, we talk about that, that God 
allows us to go through difficult places. And of course, you know, we're in a we're in a climate in the church where there's been so much talked about that Christians don't suffer and they're not going through anything and and that if you have faith, you'll never have any tests or trials, but that's not scripture. It's right here, Jesus forced them, he sent them into a storm that literally was gonna terrify them. And when he put them into the storm, he, he got them in the boat, the scripture says that he then went up into a mountain and he began to pray. And I think that Jesus was praying for his disciples because he knew what they were getting ready to encounter. And there's a verse that says that Jesus forever maketh intercession for us to the Father. And whether you realize it or not, even right now, Jesus is praying over you. Doesn't matter what kind of situation you're in, doesn't matter what you're going through, Christ in heaven right now is praying over you. And uh, there are other times the scripture will talk about it when when Peter was getting ready to go, <clears throat> excuse me, getting ready to go through the trial of his life, Jesus looked at me and said, Peter, the devil wants to have you and sift you, but he said, I have prayed for you that your faith won't fail. And so I think that the Lord was looking for faith here. Um, he's hoping that what they have just experienced with the five loaves and the two fishes is, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a problem in my throat today, that would build their faith. And he sends them into this storm. And listen, I, I want you to get this. God will never send you into a storm that he does not equip you with the faith to navigate it. He will never give you a place of testing that he has not already equipped you to survive it. And um, he sends them into this storm, and, and it's in the midst of the sea. It's somewhere in the darkest of night. Jesus begins to come to them, and they don't recognize him. They've never seen anybody walk on water. And Jesus just said, hey, guys, don't be afraid. It's me. And the storm's still going on. And Peter says, Lord, if that's you, bid me come. And... I love the faith of Peter. This is one of the reasons why Jesus picked him on the day of Pentecost to preach that message. The storm is tossing this boat, and they're in the midst of contrary winds. Waves are coming up, perhaps spilling over the boat. Here's Jesus standing out in the midst of this storm. Whatever storm you're in as a believer, I'm telling you, Jesus is already in the middle of it. And he's on, he's on his way to see you. And Peter says, Lord, if that's you, bid me come. And <clears throat> Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on water. And, of course, we know there for a brief moment that uh, he got his eye off of Jesus and begins to sink. But immediately Jesus takes his hand and picks him up. And I, this is what the Scripture says. <clears throat> and when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. I think that sometimes, I, I believe this, when you read this story, that storm never ended till somebody got out of the boat in faith and walked with Jesus. And uh, I think that the Lord needs some men and women in our nation right now, the storm that we're in, to step into the middle of it and say, God, I want to be with you, and I believe that we're going to make the storm cease. Why would the Lord allow them to go through this storm? And, and this, this is why I think, because verse 33 says this, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. The only way you're ever going to have a true revelation of who Jesus is is you're going to have to have him reveal himself to you in difficult times. It's not the times of prosperity and the times of joy and the times of abundance that the nature of God is revealed to us. See, I think the Lord wanted them to have a greater revelation because 
they were amazed at the miracle of the 5,000. 5, but when the Lord constrained them, he sent them into this storm. He had a purpose for it because he wanted to reveal himself to them in the storm. And it is in this storm that they got a revelation of who Jesus was because the scripture says that when Peter and Jesus got back in the boat, the storm abated and the rest of the disciples began to worship the Lord. And they said this, thou art the son of God. And I, I want to encourage you because, you know, all of us are in storms. My wife and I have talked about this the last uh, year or so has been a very difficult year. And it's not just, not just us. It is the body of Christ. And you think, God, what are you doing? And uh, it could be that the Lord has sent us into a storm because there's a revelation of who he is that he wants to reveal to us. Now, I want us to flip over to uh, Psalms chapter 23. Uh, this is, of course, probably the most famous psalm, except for maybe Psalm 1. And um, is D David's writing this, and he's he's writing it um, in a time where he's in a very difficult season of his life. Uh, he has run from Saul, and uh, verse one he says, of course, he says, "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want." And he says, "He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters." First of all, I want to tell you this. When you're a believer, uh, you don't have to live in storms. There are seasons where God wants you to be blessed and prosper. And this is what David said. He said, he has created me to lie down in green pastures, pastures that are producing, that are fruitful. And he leads me. You notice how Jesus in, in Matthew 14, he led his disciples into that storm. But here it says that he leads me beside still waters. There are seasons for God will lead you where it works. Things are peaceful. And I think it's in those times that he replenishes our virtue and he replenishes our strength. And we have that sweet communion with the Lord and um, it's, be, it's be in those times, it's beside the still waters where he restores my soul. And then David again says this. He says, God leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Um, I truly believe this, Sid, that if you are a true child of God and you've yielded yourself to the Lord, the paths that you walk in are paths that God leads you in. Um, you know, there's a verse, it's, I think it's in maybe John chapter 13, but it says this, um, Jesus said this, in this world, you are going to have tri tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer, for I have already overcome the world. That's why John said, as Christ is, so are we in this world. Um, I promise you there is not a storm that God will allow you to go through that can kill you. Storms make believers stronger. And so uh, just want to transition through this. In verse 4, um, we, we transition from verse 2 where we're beside still waters. And then verse 4 is saying that there are seasons where God literally walks us through the valley of the shadow of death. It means that the enemy is so close to us that we can see his shadow. Uh, uh, there's something the scripture teaches very strong that God has not destroyed the devil. He's only defeated him. And the enemy will constantly test us in our revelation of the fact that he's defeated. And so uh, David said this, that, there are going to be seasons in my life that I walk through valleys where I can smell death. I can see the shadow of death. But he said, I will fear no evil because your rod and your staff, they, they take care of me. This is the verse that I want to dwell on next, verse 5. It's really 
came up in my spirit in prayer. Thou preparest a table before me. And boy, that, you know, when I think about the fact that that there is a table that I can partake of, that God has set. Can you imagine what kind of table uh, that you can sit down to if God has set it? If God's cooked the meal, he's not going to give you leftovers. He's not going to give you things that are second best. But as David said this, he said, Lord, you have prepared me a table. That means that everything on that table can meet every single need in your life. It means that when you sit down at this table, you're going to partake of the things that God has created for you to partake of. But this is what really got to me. He prepared me a table, and this is where he prepared it. In the presence of my enemies. You see, uh, a lot of times Christians don't realize this, that um, our enemies don't go away, but we can defeat them. But the Lord said, I'm going to show you my power. He said, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to set a table before you that will fulfill you, satisfy your desires. And God said, I'm going to do it and make your enemies around you just have to watch while I bless you. And see, a lot of us, we, we get our eyes on, on our enemy and then it starts messing with us. And even, even today when I was praying, uh, I really had to repent because uh, we're, we're human. But I, I was telling the Lord, I said, I, I repent for allowing the enemy to toss me to and fro. That one day you get up and you're excited about God and and then something will happen by that night or the next day, and you're fighting all kinds of discouragement. All kind. God wants us to be resolute and consistent in Him, and not back and forth, tossed like a, a, a by the wind of the waves of the ocean. And so, when David spoke this, he said, "God is going to prepare a table of blessing for you and me," and he said. He's going to do it in the presence of your enemies. You know what that means? That enemies that have tried to rob you and malign you and speak all kind of evil against you and have rejoiced in your sufferings and your difficulties, God said, this is what I'm going to do to them. I'm going to make them stand and I'm going to make them watch, hallelujah, while you sit at a table that I have prepared for you. See, a lot of times we thank God that, that when you're going to bless me and take care of me, it's going to be in a concealed environment and, and I won't see anything. There'll be no evil around. No, the Lord said, listen, I'm going to show you my power. I'm going to prepare you a table of blessing. And he said, I'm going to do it in the presence of your enemies and they're going to have to stand and watch and there's not one thing they can do about it. And the Lord said this through David. He said, when I'm sitting at that table that you have prepared for me in the presence of my enemies, he said, God, you're going to anoint my head with oil. You're going to give me favor. And he said, not only that, he said, my cup won't be empty. But he said, while I'm sitting at the table that you have prepared for me, he said, my cup will run over with the blessing of the Lord. I think prophetically that, that God is going to make the enemies of God's people in this hour have to stand and watch while he blesses us. And I, and I promise this is going to be so painful for the enemies of God's people that have for decades seemed like triumph and rejoiced and watched us to have difficulty and go through tribulation. And the Lord said, here's your punishment. Now I'm going to rob you of your ability to affect my people. And he said, 
I'm going to set a table before them in the middle of their enemies. And he said, y'all are going to have to watch while God's people prosper. I want to encourage you in the Lord that God leads us. And for the disciples in that storm, it was to produce a revelation of who Jesus was. And some of you are going through difficult times now, and what it is, it, it, God's hands on you. He's right there. He's in the middle of your storm, but he's wanting to reveal himself. That's where God reveals himself the most, is in the storms of our life. And the Lord had already prophetically said, you're going to the other side. God is never going to allow the enemy to afflict you at its own whim, but there is a protection around you. So when you go through storms, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. You always remember this. I'm in this storm because God might have allowed it, but God is also going to show up in the midst of this storm, just like he did the three Hebrew children in the midst of the fire or Daniel in the lion's den or in the prison of Paul and Silas. God is going to show up or on the Isle of Patmos for John the Revelator to reveal those things to him. He will show up in your storm and you and him will walk out of it and you will have a revelation of who God is in a greater measure. So I, I pray this has been a blessing to you. Um, continue to pray over the next few weeks for our nation, our election, that God's will would be done. I love you. I pray for you. You stay strong in the Lord, and I'll see you next week. For more information about Kent Christmas Ministries International or Regeneration Nashville, go to kentchristmas.org or regenerationnashville.org. And for the latest updates or videos, follow us on Facebook and subscribe to us on YouTube. God bless you. Thank you.